Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Endo 2018 News Conference on Diabetes. My name is Aaron Lohr. I'm the Chief Communications Officer at the Endocrine Society. It is my delight to welcome you here for our last news conference of Endo. Um, so before we get into the presentations, I just want to give you a few rules. We do have a few rules here. One uh, is just to remember that everything here is being webcast live, which means that if we're not speaking into microphones, the people on the webcast can't hear what we're saying. So we're going to ask all of our presenters to make sure you speak into these microphones. During the question and answer session, it's important that you wait until that microphone comes to you. We have one that will pass around. You can speak into it. That helps us out a lot. If you're on the webcast and you have a question, there's a chat program there. You can go ahead and just type your questions in, and we'll read them aloud here in the room, and uh, you can ask your questions then. Um, there's a special nuance to this news conference. If you've been following the others, this one's going to be just a little bit different. That's because Diana here is going to have to run to another session. So she's going to give her talk. We're going to do a special question and answer session just for her. And when that's done, she's going to go ahead and leave. And then we're going to have Dr. Wood and Dr. Olde Bekink give their presentations, and we'll have one more Q&A after both of them have gone. Okay, so let's get done with these rules. Let's go ahead and invite our first presenter up. Uh, our first presenter is Diana Elizondo. She's a graduate student at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Uh, why don't you come on up to the podium? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me today. I'm very excited to talk about my work on the restoration of insulin production and reversal of type 1 diabetes utilizing a noble microcarrier. So since I'm the first one speaking, I just wanted to give a brief overview on what is the problem happening with diabetes. So just briefly, we get, we consume food, the stomach converts this food into glucose, it's sent to the bloodstream, and then the pancreas takes an action saying you have to increase this glucose in the bloodstream. So it secretes insulin, brings the glucose levels down. Now the problem with type 1 diabetics afflicted people is that this the pancreas that produce, the cells that produce insulin in the pancreas are not able to produce insulin because they are no longer there. So what is the problem with having um, high glucose levels in the bloodstream? So this leads to several consequences such as having vision loss, induced diabetic coma, heart failures, increased limb amputation risk, kidney and nerve damage, among many other secondary effects that I don't have time to go over. But ultimately, having high glucose levels in the, glu in the bloodstream will lead to having a uh, severe morbidity and or increased um, possibility of that. So what is the solution that I am proposing in my research? I'm proposing to implant insulin-producing cells in a cell macrocarrier or biomaterial to allow these diabetic afflicted people to produce their own self-sustained insulin. So this will work by having a um, semi-permeable membrane that will be seeded with beta cells or insulin-producing cells. This will be able to sense the glucose in the bloodstream as well as secrete insulin out and decrease these um, levels. So the cool thing about this semi-permeable membrane is that it can also prevent infiltration of immune cells and prevent the cells inside the macrocarrier from destruction. So in diabetic individuals, we have no islets or, or destruction of the islets or beta cells, so no insulin production. So if I'm able to implant these biomaterials seeded with beta cells into the individuals, um, I hope to achieve now having a restoration of insulin production. So how does my macrocarrier work? Uh, there's a lot of chemistry involved here. I'm not going to go over this. Um, but I will briefly tell you that we start by having a backbone of polymers that undergo a couple of chemical reactions and ends up having a copolymer. The great thing about this copolymer is that it well resembles the extracellular matrix of the cells. So how is this going to help me uh, achieve the goal of implanting islets into uh, diabetic patients and allow insulin secretion? Well, it will electrostatically attract the cells that are being mixed with, or in this case, the islets. And because it has a porous um, characteristic, it will allow the cells to go inside the microcarrier and maintain it in this place. So I want to show you a quick macro illustration of how the microcarrier looks like when I work with it in the lab. On the left picture, we can see right here how the microcarrier doesn't have any cells, and we see the size being very finite and small and being all spread across the flask. When I add the eyelets, 
uh, I immediately see how it becomes, it starts forming this unified structure having um, these aggregates. What made me think, well, these are the cells getting inside the microcarrier. Uh, causing this change in the shape. So of course I had to make sure that what I was looking at was the actual cells inside the microcarrier. So I labeled the cells with a red dye. If we look on the top picture, we can see the microcarrier with no cells. Bottom picture, that is our microcarrier with the cells inside. So at this point I was able to prove that the microcarrier can attract the cells in the same location. So the next question was, can the microcarrier allow for functionality and proliferation of the cells while they are inside the biomaterial? So I looked under microscopy, and if we look at the left picture, this is um, just normal cells with no um, fluorescence. On the right picture, we can see two colors, red and green. Green is because the cells are designed so that whenever they produce insulin, they turn green color. So we can see how the cells are actually functional. They are producing insulin while, while they are inside the biomaterial. We can also see the red color, meaning that the cells that it, uh, did uptake this dye, and this will help me assess the proliferation, as I did on my uh, bar graphs right here where we can see how the cells don't proliferate on day zero, of course, and then we can start seeing the increase in proliferation over time. So the next question was, um, is this functionality of the cells in the biomaterial physiologically relevant, which is, I think, the most important question. So I um, had a control group with an empty biomaterial, so no cells seated into, and then my group with my eyelids seated into the biomaterial. So I transferred or injected this biomaterial in the peritoneal cavity of a mouse, diabetic mouse. And the first thing that I noticed when I took the biomaterial out was uh, that the biomaterial can recruit this vascularization around it, which is very important because this is telling me that the cells are now going to have access to the bloodstream, so they will be able to sense the glucose being high and as well as produce insulin and send it to the target places. Um, <clears throat> so um, then the question, and now this is the most important question, was the cell seeded biomaterial able to lower the glucose levels in the diabetic mice? So I used two models. I used a model that I induced to be diabetic by injecting this SDC drug. And I used a genetically designed mouse model to develop spontaneous type 1 diabetes. If we uh, look after implantation of the biomaterial, we can see how in both models the glucose levels decreased in the mice treated with um, biomaterial treated with cells. So up to this point, I've been, I was able to show that the biomaterial can well support the growth and the functionality of the cells both in vitro and in vivo. So the um, diabetic mice were able to restore um, normal glycemia or reduce the pathology. So just um, for anyone interested in testing this biomaterial for a different application, I just wanted to leave up this information of the creator of the biomaterial, Dr. Dashi Yang, as well as videos showing uh, the biomaterial seeded with karyomyocytes. So we can clearly see how there's a synchronized contraction showing the heart cells uh, beating and working function um, properly. This biomaterial has been provided by Acrogenic uh, Technologies. Just to mention some of the characteristics of the biomaterial very quickly, uh, this is a low immunogenicity, so it doesn't cause in immune responses upon implantation in vivo. It well resembles the extracellular matrix due to its porous capacities. Uh, it has a positively charged um, surface that will attack attracts the cells to, towards it. And it has um, physical and chemical properties that can be well adaptable for uh, various cell types, not only pancreatic cells or powder myocytes. Thank you for your attention, and now I'm open for any questions. So while we're, while we're waiting to see if there are any questions, I'll, I'll ask this is very promising. It seems very, you know, something new, something novel. What's what's next, you know, for your work? Okay. So this is, all, so far I've been showing only optimization data. We first wanted to make sure that the biomaterial is safe in the mouse model, that it can restore the normal glycemia. Uh, next thing I want to improve is, if you notice in my graphs, um, I haven't been able to show survival curves. So I wanted to see for how long can the biomaterial stay in the mouse reducing? Can the mice actually, uh, will they need a boost of the biomaterial? Will one shot of the biomaterial be enough to restore the um, normal glycemia to a point? Or um, another thing, 
well, yeah, I think it's just ensuring that this biomaterial is safe for the mice and then let it go for further trials. <clears throat> Have you done any biopsies to see that the biomaterial is it getting invaded or not invaded by uh, immune cells? Yes, so I, I've been excising the biomaterial out. I haven't done the immune cell infiltration in the biomaterial that's yet, but that's definitely one of the key things that I'm going to do right after I come back into my lab. <laughs> All right, if there are no other questions, we'll wish you the best as you run off to your next session. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. It was and then great we'll, talking to you. Thank you. And then we'll continue here in just a moment. Okay. Our next presenter is going to be Dr. Michael Wood. And Dr. Wood is Associate Professor of Pediatrics and the Clinical Director of the Pediatrics Diabetes Program at the University of Michigan Medical School in Ann Arbor. You can come on up to the podium. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk and present this study on behalf of all the investigators and the children who uh, entered the study. Disclosures, the hybrid closed loop trial was supported by Medtronic and all of the different centers that were part of this research received research funding from Medtronic. So all investigators in both trials received support and compensation for conducting these studies. Some important safety information on the Medtronic Minimed 670G system. It's very important that I make everybody aware both here and on the call that this system is currently FDA approved for children 14 and above. It is not approved for the group that I'm going to talk about, which is age 7 to 13. Um, and so you can read all the rest of those disclosures there, but it's very important to understand that it is not FDA approved yet for age 7 to 13. So the background in talking about this study, uh, achieving and maintaining uh, good glucose control as set by the American Diabetes Association remains a challenge for everybody, all, all patients with uh, type 1 diabetes. Automated insulin delivery systems that help maintain normal blood glucose values during the day are now a reality. In previous studies that have been reported, three-month in-home use of the Medtronic Minimed 670G hybrid closed loop system in patients 14 to 75 years of age reduced hemoglobin A1Cs from 7.4 to 6.9 percent, showing good uh, effectiveness, improved the time in the target glucose range from 67 to 72 percent, reduced time in hypoglycemia less than 70 milligrams per deciliter from 5.9 to 3.3 percent, and reduced day and night variability. So our study, again, uh, this is, our site was one of nine different sites, eight in the United States and one in uh, Israel investigated the safety of this system in children with type 1 diabetes age 7 to 13. This is a, a graphic of the system itself. Um, the top box is the pump itself, and this is called the 670G system. The contour next link blood glucose meter is where the uh, patient subject will uh, poke their finger and be able to put those numbers into the system to calibrate the sensor. The sensor is on the lower right there. And then on the lower box is how the system looks when put on a patient. The sensor itself uh, communicates the information to the pump. The pump has a, an electronic brain inside of it, which decides how much insulin to administer based on whether the glucose that's from the sensor is either going up or down. So the pivotal trials in our group, the first column there, the pediatrics group, age 7 to 13, there were 105 children. Compared to the adolescent group, there were 30 of, of those subjects and then 94 of the adult subjects. And again, the adolescents and adults were reported previously. These are the baseline data on folks. Basically, there was an equal split between uh, male and female, and you can see all the rest of the information there. So our study was again involving the seven to 13 year old children. For two weeks they were in what was called open loop mode, which is where they were wearing the continuous glucose monitor as well as the, um, uh, the pump system for in what's called open loop for about two weeks. 
After that, then they entered the study phase. They were entered to what's called closed loop auto mode, where the system was functioning as, as best as currently available in artificial pancreas. Uh, this three-month window also included an overnight clinic stay for six days and five nights to evaluate the sensor uh, and to evaluate the safety of the system. We did not present the data in this study. And then the folks after the three-month study phase were allowed to continue the system through a continued access program. Here are the graphs of the uh, both median and 25th to 75th percentile data for glucose values across a 24-hour period. In the upper left-hand part was the pediatric group, and in the upper right was the adolescent group, and then in the bottom was the adult group. And what you can see is that the pink shaded area is all lying within the darker blue area. I don't know if that translates very well, if people can see it. But the, the variability of the glucose is better, and the averages are better. So this uh, describes the results, both in the pediatrics, adolescents, and adult group. The hemoglobin A1C of baseline for the pediatrics, the 7 to 13-year-old age group, was 7.9. At the end of the three months, the hemoglobin A1C improved to 7.5%. Really a very similar response in terms of improvement as you was seen in the adolescents and adults part of the study. On the third row there is the overall um, variability of the uh, uh, sensor glucose values. It improved in the pediatrics group as well as the adolescents and adults. And the total daily dose of insulin went up just slightly in all three groups. And what we're really excited about is the percentage of time that the subjects actually spent in the goal range. Um, the 71 to 180 milligrams per deciliter range in that uh, row that's green there went from 56 to 65 percent in the pediatrics group, from 60 to 67 percent in the adolescents, and 68 to 73.8 percent in the adults. So in summary of the more than 12,000 patient days of system use by the adolescent and an adult groups, and over 15,000 patient days of system use by the 7 to 13 year olds, there were no severe hypoglycemic events and no ketoacidosis events, which is really an exceptional safety record. The data showed, compared to baseline, that three-month use of this system in all three age groups improved the average glucose value by, uh, as uh, uh, depicted by the hemoglobin A1C, reduced day and night variability of glucose, improved time and target range, and reduced hypoglycemia. 80% of the adolescents and adults, and all except three children, stayed with the system uh, to maintain continued access after the study. So in conclusion, diabetes management, especially in children, remains a challenge. The Menemed 670G system may provide a means to impress, to improve glycemic control in some patients with diabetes. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Wood. And now I'm going to invite our final presenter to come up to the podium. Our final presenter is Dr. Marlene Oldebekink. Uh, from, uh, she's an endocrinology fellow at Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining the session. I'm an uh, endocrinology fellow from the Radboud University. I'd like to thank the organizers of the Endocrine Society for the opportunity to present our study in this session. And it's a study on the early detection of hypoglycemia. So when you think about diabetes, it can be challenging to maintain normal blood sugar levels while you're on insulin. So patients with type 1 diabetes require insulin immediately after the diagnosis is made because their own pancreas does not produce insulin anymore. So insulin can be considered a life-saving therapy for them. However, insulin also has a major side effect, that is hypoglycemia or a low blood sugar. And usually this causes symptoms like a blurred vision, shivering, or hunger that urges the patient to ingest carbohydrates in order to prevent a further decline. However, some patients with diabetes do not recognize symptoms of low blood sugar anymore. And this is a problem called impaired awareness of hypoglycemia, which is the case in 25% of our patients. 
And that is a major source of anxiety among our patients. Imagine if you are driving a car and you do not feel the decline in your blood glucose anymore. So last year, a Dutch car driver with type 1 diabetes was very unlucky to have a severe hypoglycemia while he was driving. And he lost his consciousness and he crashed his car into a wall outside of Amsterdam Central Station. And initially, the police thought it was a terror attack, but it turned out the patient had a severe hypoglycemia. So luckily, nobody died in this accident, but this is still a serious issue, right? We feel that impaired awareness of hypoglycemia is a serious problem, especially since patients with type 1 diabetes experience hypoglycemia every week, so approximately once to twice every week on average. So the study I'm presenting today is a study in which we try to develop an algorithm in order to early alert for hypoglycemia. And this algorithm is based on heart rate, because normally with the fall in a blood glucose level, the body activates some counter-regulatory mechanisms, including the activation of the so-called sympathetic nervous system, releasing epinephrine. And this causes an increase in heart rate, but it also changes heart rate variability. And heart rate variability can be defined as a normal beat-to-beat -beat variation between heartbeats. So although this heart rhythm may seem regular, there are still minor variations if you have a closer look at the intervals. So the length of the intervals may vary, and this is called heart rate variability. And we know from the literature that specific changes in heart rate variability may occur at the initiation of hypoglycemia. And that is why we hypothesize that heart rate variability might be a useful parameter to early alert for hypoglycemia. However, the interest in heart rate and heart rate variability is not new, because traditionally heart rate was measured via a Holter device or a single ECG, or excuse me, a usual ECG device. But nowadays, we can make use of commercially available wearables that are really small devices that you can carry on your chest like a plaster, and they continuously measure heart rate via a single lead ECG providing us with real-time data. So, the aim of our study was to see whether we could develop an algorithm based on heart rate variability to early detect hypoglycemia in patients with type 1 diabetes. And for this, we set up a proof of principle study in which we included adult patients with type 1 diabetes who were either using continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion or multiple daily injections. And all patients had to have a sinus rhythm, so patients with either cardiac arrhythmias or medication interfering with heart rate, such as beta blockers, were excluded. So the procedure was as follows. We asked our patients to wear the health patch for five consecutive days, and they also wore a glucose monitor. And then we asked them to manually register all hypoglycemic events in the diary and also register whether or not the hypo had caused any symptoms. And if the glucose monitor was the first to alarm the patient, then we still ask them to verify the glucose level because finger stick measurements were the starting point of our analysis. And a hypoglycemic event was defined as a glucose level of less than 70 milligrams per deciliter measured by finger stick. So, after five days, we calculated, or we didn't calculate, we collected the data from the GBM readouts, the diaries, and the health patches, and then we started analyzing the data retrospectively. And we calculated parameters of HRV both before and during the hypoglycemic events. And here you see a description of our study population. So we've just closed our inclusion last week because we reached our predefined number of hypoglycemia, and we're now still in the middle of running our analysis. However, I'm very happy to be able to present to you the preliminary results of the first 10 patients in our study. And this patient group included three males and seven females. They've had diabetes for approximately 45 years. Um, excuse me, they, their average age was 45 years, and they've had diabetes for approximately 24 years, as you can see in the table. Um, their glycemic control was reasonable, and as you can see, the vast majority of the patients were using subcutaneous insulin infusion. And here are the preliminary results of 39 hypoglycemic events among 10 patients. 
The average glucose level was 54 milligrams per deciliter, and it ranged from 29 to 70 milligrams per deciliter. And here you see a typical pattern of HRV at initiation of hypoglycemia. And at the horizontal axis, you can see a picture. And the picture shows us when the finger stick measurement was taken. So at that moment, the patient experienced a hypo, which is now highlighted by the vertical red line. And as you can see, changes in HRV already occurred prior to the hypoglycemic event. So you can see a clear increase in this HRV parameter prior to the hypoglycemia. And like this, we found patterns in HRV, similar patterns in most, but not all, hypoglycemic events. So we found changes in HRV in 28 of the 39 hypoglycemic events, which is 70%. So, in summary, this proof of principle study showed us that measuring HRV using a wearable in an outpatient setting is both feasible and also well tolerated by our patients. We found that specific changes in HRV could be detected prior to hypoglycemia. And as I already mentioned, we're still in the middle of running our analysis. So we will have to further refine the algorithm in order to increase its accuracy. And once we've managed to do that, we do think that continuous measurements of HRV via wearables can be promising for early alerting to upcoming hypoglycemia. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I'd like to thank my colleagues from the Radboud University Nijmegen Medical Center, and also like to thank the Dutch Diabetes Research Foundation for their financial support of this study. Thank you. Okay, and now we will open up the floor to questions. Just a reminder that if you have a question, we do ask that you speak into the microphone, which is just about on its way. Make sure you say who you are and, and who you are with, and then go ahead and ask your question. And here comes the microphone, I think, over here first. Hi, I'm John Otromke with Aptus Original Content. Wondering about both presentations, actually. Uh, uh, are these presentations related to any articles that were published in any of the journals? And if so, could you tell me the citations? <clears throat> On my slides for, for ours are two of the citations of the adolescent and adult data. The pediatric data have not yet been published, but will be soon. And in terms of Farage study, we didn't publish the data yet. As I mentioned, we're still in the middle of running our uh, analysis. So. Uh, hopefully this year or early next year. Uh, Ed Sussman with uh, MedPage today. Uh, Dr. McKink, uh, what do you expect um, wearing the patch will do other than give you academic information? Is, is there some way that this would be useful to a, to a patient so that it can somehow trigger an alarm that he's should turn off the car? Yes, that's a good question. I think that will be the goal eventually. Uh, but first, we have to make sure that the algorithm is very accurate, so it's very specific and also sensitive to the hypoglycemic events. And I know that at the moment there are many patients wearing a glucose monitor, and that's also a very helpful device because it can inform us about glucose levels throughout the day without the need to perform finger stick measurements all the time. However, we also know that there is a disadvantage, and that is that there is a lag time. And that's probably because a glucose monitor does not measure glucose in the blood, but it measures glucose in the subcutaneous fluid instead. So that in particular compromises its accuracy in the lower glycemic range. So we do feel then in the lower glycemic range maybe or um, wearable in, in combination with our uh, algorithm could help. Uh, improved accuracy in the lower glycemic range. How um, well did the, your population um, want to wear the patch? Uh, um, you know, what was your, your denominator of people you approached to wear the patch and versus how many of them actually put it on? Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's actually nice to mention that the inclusion went very smoothly. We specifically um, 
decided to look for patients who were already wearing a glucose monitor because in our patient clinic those are usually the patients that experience hypoglycemia frequently and um, well when we first launched this idea in the Netherlands there was also already a lot of media attention so that shows us I think that there is a need for the development of such a device and some patients contacted me by themselves to see whether they could um, participate in the study. So I think there is a big need um, yeah, that shows us there is a need for this. And, and what are your next steps in, in this, in, in developing this, in, in coordinating the, the patch and the monitor together? Well, I think first steps that we have to do is increase the accuracy uh, of our algorithm. And um, we know from the literature that um, heart rate variability uh, can be very individually determined. So there is a, a lot of difference in, in heart rate variability between individuals, and that's because there are many other factors influencing heart rate variability, such as uh, gender, age, and, for example, diabetes duration. So I think we have to um, provide our algorithm with more piece of information about the patient so that the algorithm can learn what is normal, what's a normal heart rate variability for this patient to be able to distinguish what is abnormal in this patient. And I think I'd like to add something to that. One of the biggest worries and fears we have about using automated technology in children and adults is the fact that the sensors are just not 100% perfect in the low range. Mm -hmm. So in fact, you could envision a scenario where somebody would be wearing a device like this as a separate piece of information that, that corroborates mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. continuous glucose monitor to give an even better predictive model of when somebody is low. At night in particular, that's what we're, we're in children we're very worried about the night. Mm -hmm. Hi, Chris and Monica with MedPage today. My question is for Dr. Wood. So you kind of just touched on this. I was wondering, do you have any specific concerns with this younger population, I guess, at night? And I was wondering maybe while they're at school? Well, uh, a couple things. First of all, I probably didn't make clear enough. The families still do have to poke their finger. They still have to administer a bolus of insulin when they eat. The system that's so unique about the 670G is that based upon the continuous readings, it basically turns off insulin basically in between meals or turns it on depending on whether the sugar is rising or falling. We had a very big concern about automating insulin delivery in any age group, let alone the little ones. And I will tell you that the families have decided Basically, almost everyone entered into the phase where they were done with the study, and now they're in the continuation phase of the study. And at least it's my experience that when families, they vote with their feet, meaning if they decided that this system wasn't helping them, they wouldn't have gone on and done the extra two years in the study. Many of them are in the middle of that. But the night in particular, for families and the, uh, the parents of young children in our group age 7 to 13 is very well controlled by this system. And that is such a reassurance to the families that, um, like I said, I can only tell you by the fact that only a couple of children in this study out of the 105 children decided not to stay with it once the study phase was done. So it works and it works really well and there was absolutely no severe hypoglycemia throughout the whole study. Um, do you know why those few people that didn't choose to continue on with it, do you know why they didn't? Well, I know that, it, and this is not published information, but I heard through the grapevine that some of the adolescents and adults who decided not to stay with the system and about 80% did, but about 20% didn't, was the fact that, the, that it was very difficult for those folks to live with the fact that they couldn't control everything minute by minute and they had to give up their control to an electronic device. The trade-off in the kids is that the, in the younger group, the families realize that it's difficult to control diabetes. 
the variability in appetite, the variability in activity every day, makes it very difficult in the young age group to control things. And so they decided that what was available as part of this system was better than how they could do it controlling it themselves. And so the, some of the older folks, especially in the adult group who decided to, I think, not participate in the continuation phase of the study, I heard from a couple of them that it's just they preferred to control everything themselves as they've been doing for a number of years. Um, so I don't know if that answered, I hope that answered your yeah. question, Thank but you. I have a feeling it was simply because people were used to controlling things themselves for those folks who decided not to stay on. But in the young group, the families realize they can't control it all that well anyway, so that, so that they realize that the system does a better job than they can do. Thank you. Uh, John O'Tromke again. Dr. Wood, did you say that there was some data uh, that you were not presenting? Could, could you remind us? Uh, no, we're, we're publishing all of the information that, that we're able to publish, but it's, it's not out yet. What I'm saying is in talking to uh, people around the country who had some adult subjects who decided not to participate in the continuation phase. I think there was a subset of those folks, it's not gonna be published, but there was a subset of those folks, I think, who um, really liked the ability to control it themselves, and that was one of the reasons. But there were no major issues in, in any of the groups. What, uh, what, what else characterized the subset of adults who decided not to continue? I don't think that information's been published, nor uh, I don't think it's readily available. So I have one more question. We've talked about hypoglycemia uh, here a bit today, and some of us are wondering, is there an awareness issue? Do we think that uh, patients have a good understanding of what might be causing a, a hypoglycemic event, for example, when it might pop up in the car or you know, at home? What might cause it? What might help them safeguard against those sort of events? Do we have an awareness issue? Uh, Absolutely. Um, there are a subset of patients, especially well-controlled patients, who develop something called hypoglycemia unawareness, where they lose some of the ability to release adrenaline to a low blood sugar stimulus. And those folks often lose those symptoms, and their symptoms are related to lack of sugar flow to the brain, so they become confused. And these are the folks who end up with the car accidents, and et cetera. So the systems more and more are going to be focused on preventing severe hypoglycemia, and I think both of these technologies might help with that. Hi, it's Hussman again. Um, I, both your studies and deal with uh, type 1 diabetes. Um, is there also a problem in type 2 diabetics as far as hypoglycemia is concerned, and would these, this technology work for them as well? Yes. Um, when we think about impaired awareness of hypoglycemia, you kind of immediately think about patients with type 1 diabetes. But we know that also in patients with type 2 diabetes, there can be impaired awareness of hypoglycemia. So in this first proof of principle study, we chose to study patients with type 1 diabetes. But, but as soon as we managed to get um, um, a good working algorithm, I think we should further extend the study to other study to other populations that include patients with type one type two diabetes using insulin, but also maybe um, patients after gastric bypasses who suffer from hypoglycemia. So yeah, I do think uh, those people could benefit. And the 670G should work just great for somebody with type two diabetes. In fact, it probably could work even better. Um, and the reason, of course, is because the body still maintains some ability to release insulin in type 2, which, which of course, will respond to physiologic criteria. So I, I would assume this, again, this is not published, and I'm not trying to tell you about any studies that are out there, but, but I would assume the 670G would work very well in type 2 patients. Okay, well thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to our presenters for being here today. Um, and we're gonna draw this news conference to a close.